It's Lucy Litch, and this is Tiny House Conversations. It's the Australian-based podcast where I interview experienced tiny houses, tiny builders, and adventurers in the tiny world, so you can discover how to create, build, and transition into tiny life. So you want to go tiny, but you might be wondering, where can I park my tiny house? I want to let you know that I have a special unreleased podcast episode of tiny house parking success stories from other tiny houses who were just like you and who have easily managed to find a long-term parking space for their tiny home. Some of them have even found more than one space. So if you want ideas on finding a parking space for your tiny, you can download this episode for free. To get access to it, head over to tinyhouseconversations.com forward slash tiny parking. If you enter your details there, I'll send it straight to your inbox. Now let's intro today's episode. Hey, it's Lucy bringing you another episode of Tiny House Conversations. On the show today, I have Joe Arneson, who is the co-founder of LJM Carpentry and Construction, along with his business partner and expert builder, Luke McGurgan. LJM are based in the Sunshine Coast of Queensland and build the most stunning tiny houses. I really got to feel the depth of care, authenticity, and genuine desire to want to help people build the tiny home of their dreams through talking with Joe today on the podcast as well as offline. And in this conversation, we talk about the benefits of choosing a tiny building company versus DIY building a tiny house structural considerations for building a tiny house on wheels, including considerations on the layout and distribution of load, the tiny house models LJM build and the process to work with them. We also talked about some options to connect with power, water, sewage, and off-grid solutions. We discuss questions to ask and things to look out for when it comes to finding an ethical, reliable tiny builder in your area or country, and so much more. Joe is such a lovely guy and was a pleasure to speak with. So on to this tiny house conversation with Joe. Hi, Joe. Thanks so much for joining me on Tiny House Conversations. It's so great to have you here. Yeah, it's great to be here with you, Lucy. So. Joe, you run a tiny house building company called LJM Constructions and you're based on the Sunshine Coast in Queensland. I'd love if you're able to share with us a bit about your background and then how you came to specialise in tiny house builds. Yeah, cool. Thanks for that. My background is that my first home was a converted house bus uh, off grid with a pot belly. I lived there with my mum and we had like 20 wild horses. Um, on this incredible farm and and then after that I ended up living in some converted uh, tramping huts in New Zealand and that was my normal way of life living tiny and living minimalist and then as I sort of grew older I uh, became a carpenter by trade and moved to Australia and always had this kind of desire to go back to my tiny roots and and to keep developing um, you know with the with that sort of nature and, and off-grid living. So when the tiny house industry sort of started to become about here in Australia, my ears really pricked up and I was very fortunate to meet a guy called Luke McGurgan who gave me an opportunity to work with him. And yeah, we've been building tiny houses ever since. That's great. I didn't know that you kind of had a background in in living in small spaces for yourself and I feel like that makes it I guess even more meaningful and you know because you've had that direct experience of yourself of living in small spaces and then you're able to kind of put that experience into the the style and the designs of your builds and all of that. So that's really great. Yeah, definitely. Like I I understand like how inspiring it can be to design an amazing functional home um, and yeah uh, it, it excites me a lot and what was it like living in the the converted um, house that you you talked about oh I felt like I was Peter Pan it was like 
so amazing. There were so many little kind of like hiding spots. There was an incredible loft um, bedroom, which I could jump out of. And I was just immersed in nature. And I never took it for granted. I, I always felt lucky. But as I like grew older, I realized like how fortunate I was to have that upbringing. And, and then so now to do what I do and to help other like kids live in tiny homes and families live in tiny homes and like so because we have so many beautiful places to live in Australia that's that's a pretty special feeling I think we were talking offline just before that you know this these tiny house builds in this tiny house space is really it's not just building houses like it, for a lot of people it is this way of living that can change people's lives for the better and you know there's so much meaning in it and it it's really cool to also see like the evolution of of your builds with ljm and i'd love to talk a little bit about what you guys do and you know there's a lot of people looking towards this way of living or maybe even already living this way and some people are DIY building and then other people are you know thinking about going with a building company and I just love to know from your perspective what are some of the benefits that you see of using a specialized tiny building company like yours versus DIYing your own tiny house I think that's a really good question and I think you will know what is best for you as a person who who is maybe like quite skilled and and handy with tools and I guess has time to contribute towards uh, their tiny house build I think doing a DIY tiny house you know if you have the know-how and you have the passion and the time like that you're probably capable of doing your best possible project and being so happy about it because you've created it so that that's a be a huge pro about doing a DIY. I guess a pro about doing it with a company like ours is that we can, you know, communicate and and debrief on lots of different pros and cons about your design and sort of share with you our experiences about you know what works and our experience doing things in a certain way and and what doesn't and even just with building in different areas in Australia and using different materials and talking about the trailer and talking about the whole picture, um, not just the actual build, could potentially be quite helpful for people who aren't tradies or like skilled in the construction process and, and absolute beginners. If you were to you know, be planning a project over the next three years as a DIYer, that I think you'd be more than capable of doing it. Um, if you're sort of wanting to like design and construct your tiny house and have it delivered to you within sort of six months, it, it would be really cool to to come and work with us. Is that helpful? Yeah, that's really helpful. Really good points. And uh, something was I was thinking about as you were talking is, I mean, it's obviously definitely possible so many people have DIY their homes, but there is this extra layer of, especially with the way of regulations and caravan codes and building codes and all of that, to really be on top of those things. And, you know, I'm wondering for you guys, so what kind of codes do you follow for your builds? Yeah, that's another really good point and question. Also, another thing that some people decide to go for with with working with us that's kind of a happy medium is building to what we call lockup. So that's where we do all the external, customise all the different window dimensions and placements, build the lofts in and all internal walls, and then so it's fully waterproof, and then you can finish off the internal yourself and sort of do that at your own pace. So that can be a good good option for people who you know want to be hands-on want to be involved but um, just want that sort of starting base and the trailer in terms of what we do with uh, around building to codes we are fully licensed carpenters HIA members and QBCC licensed my business partner Luke who actually founded LJM Carpentry and Construction He's been in the building industry for 17 years um, and has 
extensive experience in carpentry building residential homes. So we build our tiny houses as if we're building a, a new build residential home. So we build to meet Building Code Australia. Mm-hmm. However, it is hard to certify that as anything because it is relocatable. It's hard to certify it as something. But we build to to make sure that, you know, all our tiny houses are extremely strong and, and to hopefully last a lifetime. Yeah, definitely. And because there's such a grey area with the regulations around tiny houses on wheels, you know, they're being classed as caravans and they don't specifically apply to the building codes. Yeah. Uh, it is, yeah, it is this big grey area. And, and if anyone's interested, episode number 21 with Elle Payton, uh, we talk all about the state of, of the different codes and, and what's happening with tiny houses on wheels and caravans. So I'll put a link in the show notes for that for anyone who wants to check it out. But I think it is a, it is a smart idea to, even though building co- the building codes of Australia don't specifically refer to movable dwellings like tiny houses on wheels, or at least from my knowledge, they're not fully enforced and all of that. I think it is still a smart way to, to obviously do that so that you do have a structurally sound fixture as well as doing things safely and you know, making sure that it, it is something that's high quality as well. And what we do, Lucy, with all of our clients, because we're sending tiny houses to every state in Australia, for example, um, this month we've had a tiny house purchased in Tasmania, a tiny house purchased to be delivered to Broome, a tiny house um, to be delivered to Port Douglas. So, like, these are extremely, like, far away from each other distances in Australia, which is super exciting and diverse for us. But I really discuss with our clients, you know, what are the like fire risks in your area? Like what are, what do the cyclone, cyclone ratings need to be? And like really listen to, you know, their experience in their areas. And we do our research and work as a team to, to make sure that their tiny house is built as strongly as possible. And it can be a bit frustrating because I know that we are fully licensed builders and we're building our tiny houses extremely strong, but it is so hard to certify it as anything. But we do things like, you know, make sure that we've got the right fly screens um, with the right mesh on them if they're going into fire danger areas and do extensive insulation and do our research into what insulation will work best in those areas and, and really good tie down points and cyclone areas and things like that and also take pictures of it through the build so that you can, you know, if you ever did or were able to certify it, you'd have all of the sort of progress pictures so you can sort of see how it's been constructed. Oh, that's really good because I know that for things like if someone wants to insure or even register their tiny house on wheels, that those types of things are really important too and often they get asked for, for that. So it's really good to know that you guys are really on top of that. And I'm wondering as well, are you able to talk a little bit about some of the the build, types of building materials you use, like what you use for framing, cladding, insulation, that type of thing? Yeah, absolutely. So we are really fortunate because we've got an incredibly talented trailer builder who builds all of our trailers brand new uh, out of galvanised steel. He uses rock and roller, triaxle, um, shocks so they're really cushioned moving down the road and that's why we're able to deliver all over australia so that that's a really important starting base for your tiny house is getting a a really good strong trailer and base we use two different types of subfloor but we have the opportunity and we've just got onto a really good product which is like a single panel insulated seamless subfloor which just we get ordered, so if you were doing an 8 metre by 2.4 trailer all in one length, and that just drops straight onto the trailer. So I think that I'm I'm feeling really positive about that material and hoping that that will help a lot with um, things like condensation. Then we predominantly use MGP12 framing pine. I, I've been building since I was 16 with timber, and because we do so such high level customization, we can build anything with timber. It doesn't matter, you know, how long or high you want your loft. Um, 
you know, if you'd like a little step out over your drawbar, changing window sizes, building, you know, bay windows, we're, we're super open towards that because we're really confident in working with timber and we can build it really strong. However, there are pros and cons between working with timber frames and steel frames, and I understand both sides of it. And like at the moment, we're, um, we've got a tiny house in our factory, which we're sending up to Magnetic Island. And our client up there really wanted a, a steel frame tiny house, and we, we've built that for her. And we also delivered a tiny house down to ACT uh, two months ago, which we also did as a to lock up with a steel frame. So it, it really is going to come down to what we think is going to work best for our client in the area with, with the type of materials that we use. We use wool bats um, in the walls and in the ceiling, and we predominantly use colour bond on the exterior. The reason why that is is it does help to give the, our tiny houses bracing as well as um, it's a really hard-wearing uh, material, and we combine that just to break up the colour bond with Western Red Cedar and let our clients sort of customise wherever they want to put, put their cedar. And with our joinery, we always custom design that with our clients as well. And depending on what they're wanting to do, we, it depends on you know what materials we use. But a big thing we always have to consider is weight and just making sure that we're staying under that 4.5 ton mark which actually is really becoming more and more challenging um, with you know the more and more exciting design and specification options out there on the tiny house market you know with with putting in skylights and you know customized joinery and we, we just need to be aware of that, you know, and making sure that we stay under 4.5 tonnes so we can still legally be able to tow uh, all tiny houses on wheels on the roads. Yeah, and I and imagine also the colour bond is lighter than the timber, right? So that would be a, a, a good benefit of using colour bond in the, in the cladding as well? Definitely, yep. Something that I've had a, a, some questions from some listeners and I was actually thinking you might be a good person to ask about this. Like we were talking about DIY builds before um, and obviously, you know, as having a building a construction company, you guys would have to kind of manage this stuff all the time. But are you able to talk a little bit about this is around structural considerations for tiny homes on wheels? So, for yeah. example, things like the distribution of load and maybe building certain rooms in certain locations and what anything that you might have to have to say on on any of that mm, that's another really good question lucy and I, I think it's a really smart thing for diy tiny home builders um, to consider i think first of all think about like the your trailer design and where the weight how however that's set up like if the wheels are off center so the weight is distributed sort of more towards the back or the front. So first of all, just understand your trailer and, and where the weight needs to be distributed. And then if you can, have have the majority of your weight up the front towards the drawbar end um, because that's going to make the, the towing and delivery process much easier for your delivery driver. And then if possible, having your, your sort of kitchen joinery and your on one side and your stairs joinery on the other side over your wheelbase, um, that also helps really distribute the weight well. And then just being practical, like, you know, not having seven windows on one side and one window on the other side to make sure that your, your tiny house is well balanced. But if you've got a good, strong trailer, you know, that that's going to go a long way towards helping distribute your weight and making sure that you're parked on a really compacted, level, stable ground as well. That will that will go a long way to helping you out with that. Really great insights. Thank you for that. And it does make sense, you know, I guess like anything, having that strong foundation, you're talking about the trailer and then making sure the loads are evenly distributed. And yeah, that's that's really cool. And uh, I would love to know as well. So with your builds, and I think it's probably a commonly asked question too. So how can people connect to mains power, to water and to sewage with their tiny homes on wheels that you guys do? Depending on where they're going to be parking and sort of how long for, if, if it's their own land, if, if, if you're renting land, 
you need to be able to be flexible on how you're going to deal with with those um, things. Generally, tiny houses are set up with a 15 amp power supply. So that's just like a standard caravan power lead, which can plug in. If if you're going off grid, you would set up your off grid system to be able to plug into that too, either like by having solar on the roof or more commonly now we're finding our clients are having solar trailers, independent solar trailers. For water coming in, we just have like a garden hose pipe connection that you can plug straight in. If you're going to be running guttering off your roof into a water tank and then bringing that back into your tiny house, I would recommend getting a water pump to give yourself that um, extra pressure. Everyone loves a good shower. And then we use gas hot water. So most of the time we use gas hot water. The tiny house that we've got going to Magnetic Island, that's set up with an electric hot water system. With the instant gas hot water, that is run off just like a standard barbecue gas bottle. So that just connects like you would connect to your um, barbecue. And then with your grey water outlet, there's so many different ways you can do your grey water, but it's going to come down to your parking site and, you know, what's possible and what you want to set up there. And then depending on, you know, which composting toilet you're going to be using. Yeah, there there definitely is so many different options and depending on what the context is of where the house is going to be parked and, and what what's available to different people and maybe budget as well. And you yeah. talked about off-grid there. So are you able to go more into some of the off-grid solutions that you offer with your homes? Yeah, absolutely. So I always listen to like what um, our clients or future clients are, are looking for in terms of like their lifestyle and what how many people are going to be living within their tiny house, where it's going to be parked, um, and then try and direct them towards professionals that will be able to best help them in their fields and give them different options. We're very fortunate because we've had our same electrician uh, for our whole journey for the last four years, and um, they're really experienced with off-grid solar. So we, we do often put solar on the roofs of our tiny houses. The advantages of that is that we can do it all in the factory um, and have it all ready to to basically go and it can be delivered all together. I guess the disadvantage of that is that it's going to add a lot of extra weight that you basically don't have to give. So that that's one option that we offer and we help people with. Another option is off-grid solar trailers. And I've paired up with someone called Brett from Iron Sled. Um, they're based down in Victoria. I did a lot of research into solar trailers and, and who was the best solar trailer operators. And, and, I, and I made a connection with Brett and could really see that their customer service and their care for their clients m- matched and mirrored what we are trying to achieve at LJM um, and, and loved that he was able to sort of customise solar trailer packages to suit needs because it is so diverse depending on where they are in Australia and you know what they're going to need to run so what what I normally do is you know understand what our clients budgets are and and what where they're going to be wanting to go and what they're wanting to do and then direct them sort of towards one of those those places and for them to get their information from a professional because like we are very good tiny house builders, but I think with solar and off grid, you're best to speak to someone that that's all they do and, and are able to sort of like direct you and educate you in the best way. That's good to know that you connected with Brett at Iron Sled because uh, uh, they were at the Sydney Tiny Homes Expo as well. And uh, yeah, it looks like they're doing some really great stuff. So I'll put a link in the show notes for anyone that wants to check them out. And Joe, I'd love if you're able to let us know a little bit more about the tiny house models that you build, the sizes, the base price ranges, and maybe even describe the style of builds that you have at LJM. Yeah, awesome. I'd love to. So we've got, at the moment, we've got five models. The tea tree, which is named after beautiful tea tree beach in the Noosa National Park. And that's just a single level tiny house, which is great for you know people um, in all age groups and that comes in a six meter 7.2 an eight meter or even a nine meter because we can get away with the weight still keeping it under 4.5 ton at nine meters long 
We recently built a tea tree for a lovely lady who was housing her father and on some beautiful acreage property up in the Noosa hinterland and um, we craned it into a back garden and that was just such a cool experience working with them and um, and sort of seeing that that project all come into life and seeing how and knowing seeing them now sort of bumping into them at the supermarket and hearing how happy they are um, with that and the tea tree model is great because it's very easy to, you know, get around and walk around being all on the one level and also extremely easy to customise. You know, if you want to have it all open plan or have a little bedroom at the end and we can build you some sort of wardrobe space in there, it, it's easy um, to customise that. And it has the beautiful gable roof line with the exposed rafters. Our second model is Lake Mackenzie, named after the beautiful freshwater lake on Fraser Island. Lake Mackenzie is is a really simple double loft design. One loft has stairs and the other loft has a ladder um, and creates a really nice big open lounge. And then the bathroom is also quite small. So that living room and, and kitchen area is just really big and open. And I find that we help a lot of like singles or maybe young couples that just want like a big sort of living area and not as much bedroom space with that design. And then we've got our mountain, mighty mountain viewer. Oh my God, I love this design. It's just so practical and it's just got such an amazing feel inside it. When you walk inside, it's like everything just opens up. You've got a double staircase connecting both lofts, uh, a nice big long three metres kitchen which can have a breakfast bar in, inside it, super practical laundry with space for a washing machine, shower and toilet and then a beautiful lounge underneath the master loft at the back end of the trailer. This is a tiny ha- the tiny house that we most recently brought to the uh, Redcliffe Tiny House Expo and a tiny house that we've built probably 35 of and I've just got happy families all over Australia loving life in that model. Uh, Another great thing about this model is it's such a great skeleton to sort of start your tiny house design off and and the, the amount of variety I've seen come out of that model, like we've never built one the same. Um, it's so nice to be able to put your own personal touch on it but just have that great base to to sort of begin from. And then we've got Broken Head, named after just south of Byron Bay uh, on on the coastline there, lovely little coastal walk. And Broken Head has a really nice easy access uh, staircase going up the back of the tiny house and, and wrapping around just to make it a bit easier to get up into your loft and just the single loft with the rest of your tiny house being all open sort of kitchen and living room plan and that one comes in a 7.2 or an 8 meter sorry back to the mountain bearer that's most commonly built in an 8 meter long as well and all of our tiny houses are 2.4 meters wide and 4.3 meters high from the ground to the finished roof height and are no more than 4.5 ton heavy there are um our five tiny house models uh, and we also do do full customs. So I have often have clients that I, I will speak with, you know, so, sort of from anywhere between like one and 12 months um, before actually sort of initiating their, their build, discussing different designs and, you know, having a dream board and getting inspiration from some of Bryce's clips or, you know, mm-hmm. some some pictures that they've seen that they really you know love and and want to work with and combining all of those things together and you know that is just such an amazing experience doing doing the full custom design and then watching the tiny house come to life it's incredibly rewarding and all of our models it's really important to know for any listeners out there thinking about you know doing a tiny house build or, or even with us is that all our models are totally customizable like even if you were to choose a model we would look at each elevation and discuss it in terms of window placements loft heights um where's it going to get parked you know can we move that window around to 
sort of get a bit of sun angle and um, we really want to make it personalised to you and, and we allow the time to do that. And we're really experienced working virtually. You know, probably 30% of my clients and some of the best tiny houses we've ever built, I've never met our clients in person. That's good. So you can service like, you know, all over the country. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's good. And what about the the price ranges of of some of the, of the builds? Like I know there's base price ranges and then obviously if people want to add things then it adds different costs and stuff, but yeah. just to give an idea. So for so to lock up stage, you're looking at sort of around fifty five thousand to sixty thousand, mm-hmm. um, and that will include, you know, your trailer fully finished on the outside and all of your window placements and internal walls and lofts with sub four, um, and then for turnkey, which is fully finished apart from appliances we get our clients our clients to buy their own appliances and have them delivered to the factory for a few reasons some people want to be off grid um, so some people want gas or electric you know it lets you allow to choose a two burner or a four burner a dish drawer you know a range hood and you can choose your own quality and have your own uh, warranties on them um, so for turnkey tiny houses they that uh, the average price for those would be about one hundred and ten thousand, um, and then the additional costs on top of that will be things like window upgrades. If you are upgrading to a nice big bifolding window or louver windows, uh, and then just like additional like customized joinery. If you wanted us to build you in some like a sofa bed or additional sort of shelving throughout, and then the. The other costs increase would be things for like solar trailers or, you know, upgrading to a, to a more expensive composting toilet and things like that. And you've mentioned a few times as well about the customization. So I'm wondering, because you talked about uh, clients bringing in their own appliances and, and yes. laying out the home maybe in different ways, depending on what, what they need. Do you also do customization with different types of paint? Like if someone wants natural paint or diff- certain types of building materials or even like shower heads and, you know, taps and do you do all that kind of stuff too for customization? Absolutely. Look, we, we want to communicate with our clients and understand how we can best work together as a team to get to the end result of having their ultimate tiny house. So we'll go above and beyond to do anything we possibly can to make that work. And if that's, you know, using eco-friendly paints or stains, um, you know, discussing different options with tapware or anything like that, of course we definitely will, yes. It's probably quite helpful, Lucy, to explain to you and the listeners about our, like, three-step design phase. Would that be helpful? That would be great because I was going to ask you anyway what the process is to work with you guys. So absolutely, now sounds like a great time. Yeah, so we we break the the design up into three stages just because it can be quite overwhelming with like the amount of options out there with design um, and specifications, and and it's also an incredibly exciting process, and you want to get it right. You know, we fully understand that. Can, that, that this is massively important and we just want to try and organise it in a way where we're sort of like taking little bites at a time to, to get to the end. So we've over time created like a three-step design phase. So the first stage, we do the main building plan. So that's where we would choose a model or, you know, combine three together and draw up some plans to effectively get our main building plans organised. Decide are we going to have you know one loft or two lofts what are the lofts going to be used for is it an office is it two sleeping areas um where where does the sun rise looking at pictures of the property where it's going to get parked and and also in the main building plans we look at the windows and windows can be incredibly time consuming to get right because they're so super super important and everything kind of like has a flow on effect from where you put your windows so that helps to sort of start thinking about, you know, all, all other elements inside your design. Through that stage, if you, because we include eight standard sliding windows or fixed windows in our quotes, you could sort of say, hey, Joe, I'd love to know how much it would cost to have like two louver windows in my bathroom and like a bifold window in my kitchen. 
And when I know like the size of your window, I can itemize that and show you, cool, it would cost, um, you know, $600 if you wanted to put a, a louver window in your bathroom or it would cost this much for a bifold in, in your kitchen. And you could choose if you wanted to add it in or not. And you can also add it in. And then at the end when you see, okay, cool, um, I actually ended up going with a solar trailer or, you know, a, a higher quality um composting toilet that I really really want I'm, I'm going to do away with the louver windows um, in the bathroom that's totally fine you know we basically just do it your ultimate way and then come back and prioritize what what the most important thing is for you so that's stage one stage two is joinery so once we've done your main building plans that allows us to get the exact measurements for your kitchen and for your stairs and, and all other places where we'll have joinery. And then you are introduced to Yannick, who's our own personalised custom joiner, and he'll work with you virtually or in person to map out the exact design of your kitchen. So are you going to have a bin drawer? Would you like a pull-out pantry? Um, what handles should we use? What finishes should we use? And, and, and simultaneously, while you're doing stage two, myself or Vicky will work with you and be doing things like flooring choices, tapware choices, so we can marry those together with your joinery. Um, and so stage three of the design is all other specifications. So we'll leave no stone unturned. We'll discuss, you know, what toilet are we using? We uh, use separate Villa 9010s and include them in all of our quotes. They're mm -hmm. really great composting toilets um, for the right situations. And they're great for us because we can set them all up in the factory. Nothing needs to be done on site. But often, like our clients have done their own research and they really want a, a different toilet, and that's not a problem. If that means sort of boxing out a, a gap in the trailer so that we can get the flu through on site, we'll, we'll, we'll do these things. Um, we'll discuss, you know, exterior cladding and colours, um, where we're going to want to place our cedar, electrical, plumbing, all basically all other specifications and that's where you've got the opportunity to you know ask for anything like supplying your own tapware or like what you're saying lucy about the low tox paint and often i will have done something like that multiple times before so i'll even have connections that i can sort of guide guide you towards and and give you our feedback of what what works really well and maybe what we could do better to improve the experience next time what's really important with understanding that design phase and specifications phase from a client's point of view is it's good to allow time um, and and to not be rushing so like if you were going to do you know thinking about going tiny or, or going to be building tiny at some point like in the next 12 months it's definitely worth reaching out so we can really enjoy that process and, and take our time and, and, you know, you can have all the time in the world to digest all the information and, and feel comfortable about the decisions that you're making. Um, and it's also good to allow time to spend with us to do that design because there is a lot of research and development on both sides to be done. Gosh, it sounds like you guys are so detailed and thorough and it's such a, a comprehensive process. It's it's really impressive. And because I know for me, I'm currently going through my own design process of getting my tiny built and I know I, I can see how much there is to go through for both sides, as you say, but also things often come up along the way that you didn't think about or when you've got new information about how things can be set up. Other things, at least from my experience, have often come up and I'm like, well, maybe I want to do it this way or that way. And so there's so many moving parts. And to be able to break down that process in, in different parts, as you say, three different areas that you do, I think that's a really great idea because, yeah, there there is so much that goes into it. And you talked about, you know, if someone's thinking about it in, say, 12 months' time, what kind of lead time do you guys have at the moment? Do you have a waiting list? And then also, is it people with their like, okay, I definitely want to go with LJM and they want to get on your building schedule. Do they pay like a deposit and then kind of the process starts from there? We, we're we currently constructing uh, four tiny houses a month and delivering them all over Australia. And we have our next available um, build in March 2023. Wow. So. Yeah, if you were wanting to work with us, uh, we would obviously love to meet you and 
I'd really encourage you to, you know, reach out to us and either organise a factory visit in person if you can make it to the Sunshine Coast or, or even do a virtual tour. We're super experienced with that. And, and if you get, give me a bit of a feel for what you're looking for, I will be able to know, oh, cool, we've got one of those builds coming up in, you know, a month and you can time it so you can come up when we've got, like, an exact similar build to what you're thinking of doing or time it so we can do a video call then. So, yeah, we're, we're next available March 2023 for a tiny house delivery. And what we do is we basically just get to know each other. Back to the design stage and, and how that all works. It's so important that we're able to like be compatible and communicate like really openly and clearly with each other. Um, and like you were saying, Lucy, you, you can make the best plan in the world, but then you'll get to like doing the build or realize something and actually realize you want to do it a different way. So there has to be openness on, on both sides with that. So if we're like, you know, doing your build and I notice something that I think could be done better, I'll just be straight on the phone giving you a call saying, hey, look, I've noticed the window maybe looks a little bit lower um, than it should be. Should we take it up 100 mil and just take like, you know, 100 mil off the overhead cupboards? I think that would give you a better view out of your kitchen. And and if there's any questions like that, I won't hesitate in calling and vice versa. Like if you've got any concerns or, or, or any input, we're, we're always open to hear it. Yeah. And once we've kind of communicated and, and got to know each other and we know we, we want to work together, I can email you a quote, which is really detailed um, and showing you all of the inclusions. And then also the optional extras like the window upgrades or the joinery upgrades or the off-grid solar to give you like a price guide. And so you, you'll be able to know exactly where your price will end up. And also a purchase agreement. So I guess this is something that I would, if you're building a tiny house with us or, or if you're building it with anyone else, I, I'd highly um, recommend you asking for, for an overall budget. So it, it's really important to, to know that, you know, the cost of the tiny house build that you build with us or another tiny house builder is not your complete cost. Like you need to be thinking about delivery to site, um, your site preparation, because our tiny houses are, you know, right on that 4.5 tonne mark. I would highly recommend putting down a small concrete pad to park your tiny house on if you can, just because that will effectively mean your tiny house will last forever because it's not got any stress put on it. If you're unable to do that or you don't want to work with concrete, no worries. Get a professional, professionally laid road base, fully level pad put down so that you can park your tiny house on that. Often we can't in install or include the guttering in the factory because it takes it outside the legal width for delivery. So you'll need to factor in things like your guttering, your downpipes, you know, your water tank, getting like your on-site um, power to site and, and things like that, you know. Um, even just small things like, you know, maybe you need to buy a new washing machine or fridge to suit suit your tiny house. It's good to really look at, at things like insurance. It's good to really look at the bigger picture rather than just like rushing straight into to doing um, doing the build. And I'm really good at educating people on their overall like cost and what they should budget before like any money is paid so that you've got kind of got the time to realistically calculate and plan for that. Um, but I think that that's a really good thing for, for people to be thinking about like before they go tiny and, and whoever they're working with, if that's like a DIY or with another builder, just to sort of calculate your, your full budget. Once everything is, you know, calculated and, and you feel like you're ready to, to move forward, we do a 20% deposit on, on the overall build cost. And that's when we initiate each other and start the, the design, the official design and specifications process. Once we've finished the design and specifications process, which can sort of take anywhere between four weeks and 12 months, um, we do another 20% deposit. And that's when we order all of your sort of like main building materials to make sure that they're all here at the factory before your build starts. And then we do the final 60% upon completion. Once you've been to the factory and or virtually seen your tiny house and you're 100% happy with all work performed. 
Great. And I love how you mentioned thinking about the that the overall cost of just having your tiny build is not the final cost, that there are all these moving parts after that. I know for me, I've got a running list of different things that I'm adding uh, up going, okay, I need to think about this, like the delivery and the, as you say, like uh, setting up the the land for parking the tiny on and then there's insurance and then maybe if you're not going off grid initially but you're thinking about doing it later whether it's water tanks or solar trailers totally. it does start to add up a lot and so that's why I know for me when I was going through my my process is like kind of weighing up with certain things like what is most important for me and am I going to have a bit of budget to to move with or should I keep that for something else that's maybe a little bit more important later so yeah I love that you brought up that point it just um, makes the whole process so much more enjoyable as well. If you're yeah. if you're educated on it, you can plan for it, and and you're going to be able to, you know, yeah, just enjoy the whole process a lot more. Yeah, definitely. I'm also wondering as well. Do you guys do financing options? Uh, we we don't uh, do it ourselves, but similarly to how I got in touch with Brett from Iron Sled Solar Trailers. I was fortunate enough to cross paths uh, with Paul Pritchard from Great Escape Finance, um, and he's incredibly knowledgeable in the tiny house space and, and finance space. And so I have been um, directing our clients to him and to Great Escape Finance, and I'm happy to say that we actually had three clients successfully get tiny house finance um, this year. And they couldn't speak highly enough of, of Great Escape Finance and, and their experiences there. So that's really positive. Yeah, I, I understand it's not an easy area to, to be in, but I, I'm confident that it will become easier in the not too distant future. Yeah, agreed. And if anyone is interested in learning a bit more about Tiny House Finance, I've got an episode with Paul Pritchett from Great Escape Finance. I think it's episode number 18, and I will put a link in the show notes for that. And it, it is good to know that those types of options are available because even though a tiny house is significantly lower than, say, purchasing a, a, a you know regular sized home or an apartment or something, for so, it still is a, a cost, and for some people, it is helpful to be able to pay it off over time. So I think that's yeah, that's good, and it's good. And I know Paul's working really hard in that space to to have more options and to make things more accessible for people and. You know, as we start to wrap up the conversation today, Joe, I just love to know, like, obviously you're based in Australia and you're servicing, you can service all around Australia. In the USA, uh, we have got quite a lot of listeners. And so if someone is looking for a tiny building company in their area or their country, from your perspective, what are some of those important questions to ask to make sure they're working with someone that's ethical, that's trustworthy, that knows what they're doing? And, you know, maybe is following certain standards or codes when it comes to tiny house building? I think ask to speak to like a client that they've already built a house for and to get um, get that like testimonial and that feedback would, would be a really good accurate way of understanding their level of care. That's what I would do if I was in the States and I had... Um, not as much knowledge as what I do here in Australia. Going back to like making sure that they outlay that help you understand your overall budget and help educate you on the overall journey of your tiny house, not just not just your build part of it. And yeah, ask if they're certified carpenters and ask if they're in Australia QBCC licensed or HIA members and, and ask for their QBCC license number and you can look it up online and see if it's see if it's actually something. And I think that it's so important when choosing uh, a tiny house builder that you from my experience and working with our clients, it's it's an amazing journey that you're going to embark on together. And you're going to get to know each other incredibly well and you're going to have highs and lows. So you, you have to really be able to connect with each other and have good, clear communication. So just finding someone that you feel like you can trust and that you, you're able to communicate well with, I think, will go such a long way in getting your best possible product. 
Thank you so much for that. And I should also add that we do have listeners from other countries as well. So, yeah, that, I think that that kind of same type of thing can apply for, okay. for everywhere, wherever you're looking to uh, find a tiny house builder. So I'd love to know as well, Joe, are there any exciting projects coming up for you guys with LJM or is there anything else that you'd like to leave our listeners with today? Uh, we've always got exciting projects. We've got four a month. Our life is exciting. I feel so <laughs> grateful to be doing what I'm doing and and being able to help people with their tiny house builds. So if anyone is interested to come and check out what we're doing and and see what, what exciting stuff we have in our factory, please, please just feel comfortable to reach out to us. It doesn't matter at what stage of your journey you're on, if you're very early or, you know, if you've got sort of any questions, all questions are good questions, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. And Lucy, thank you so much for the opportunity to come um, and do this podcast with you. And I think what you're doing is creating an amazing service for people. And I think it'll be, it is so helpful. Oh, thank you for saying that, Joe. I really appreciate it. And, you know, I have to say, and I said this to you offline, that your tiny house builds are some of the most beautiful that I've seen. And, and, you know, probably my favorite at the, that I saw at the Brisbane Expo. And, even just to see the evolution, as I mentioned earlier, of, of your designs over time and just what I'm also feeling from talking to, to you today that, you know, you guys really care and you've got this level of customer service and detail and customization that is so valuable, especially when, you know, there's lots of different companies out there now specializing in tiny house builds. And then, of course, there's also, unfortunately, the sad situations of, of those that are not doing things in an ethical way. and and all of that. So I, I really recognize that, that you you can feel this level of genuine care and wanting to to help someone, you know, bring their dreams of a, of a tiny house to life and have it as exactly as, as they'd like it or as close as possible as they'd like it. So it's really great to see what you guys are doing. And, you know, where if people want to come and find and connect with you online and have a look at what you're doing or even make a, an appointment to to chat to you or come and see you in person, where's the best place that they can do that? Where they, can they connect with you online? They can send us a message on Instagram or Facebook. And my my personal contact number is 0452541848. Feel free to send me a text message and um, we can arrange a, a time to have, have a tiny talk. I will put that in the show notes as well. And if anyone wants to access the show notes, you can find those at tinyhouseconversations.com. Again, thank you so much, Joe, for being here for your time. Thank you for your genuine care and for doing what you do in the tiny house space for building people beautiful homes and for also helping them to transition into this way of living. And as I said, that could be life-changing for a lot of people. So thank you again. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Lucy. And thanks, listeners. Yeah, and if you're listening to us today, thank you so much for being here as always. Make sure you stay tuned every Thursday for new episodes of Tiny House Conversations and I'll see you next time. Thanks again for listening and if you enjoyed the conversation today, you found it valuable and you want to support the podcast, the best way you can do that is to share the love. That way I can keep bringing you more tiny house conversations to help you on your own tiny journey. So here are three ways that you can support the podcast. Number one, if you have a friend or family member that you feel would benefit from hearing these conversations, feel free to share it with them, email them, text them, send them a telegram, do whatever you need to do to share it with them. Number two, if you hit the subscribe button, you'll know exactly when the next episode is live. And number three, if you head on over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening to podcasts and leave a five-star rating and review. Thank you so much in advance. I appreciate you and I'll see you in the next episode.